So my name is Kelvin Wilson and I'm one of those illustrators, one of those uh, archaeological reconstruction artists that we hear talked about in the margins being used as tools in these projects. Now I've had about uh, 25 years worth of experience now in the field and uh, my mind has often wandered from being a tool so I'm going to present you with some viewpoints uh, from an illustrator's view. First of all, I'm going to take you back to a very momentous moment in history, 79 AD, and uh, the Vesuvius is about to erupt. And across the Bay of Naples, uh, people can hear, uh, can feel tremors. And we have an eyewitness account from uh, Pliny the Younger, written 25 years after the date. Very beautifully written, um, his memoirs of what happened on that day. And his memoirs are... Hoe komen elkaar Je kunt de, de, de pointer blijven. This is actually what he wrote about uh, how he experienced the day. He was reading a book at the time and people came running up to him saying something momentous is about to happen and he couldn't care less. And he went back to reading his book, at one point he even dozes off and falls asleep. And um, um, this, I love this anecdote, I use it a lot, because it goes to show that in hindsight, our viewpoint of what was important in history is not automatically that of the people living through it, for whom, of course, tomorrow didn't exist yet. Um, their concerns were different, um, urgent, perhaps, to them, more urgent than to us. Um, And in hindsight, we tend to think that history is full of very, very interesting things and there's a lot to show. And so what you get is a very um, overfilled, overbearing, overkilled perhaps view of the past. This, by the way, is one of my uh, own paintings, um, which I'm criticizing here. Essentially, that is a fault of how archaeological illustrations are briefed. Because something's gone wrong here in the in the in the reproduction, but I'll I'll explain in a minute. Uh, I drew this graph to explain uh, if we take, for instance, this line, the people and their function. Let's say you have a lot of information on one certain individual. Let's say osteological information. So you know that maybe you you find the skeleton of a 25-year-old woman. You know she's had a baby in the last 10 years. Uh, you know what she died of that it, she would have suffered for six months. Mm -hmm. In that case, you will go higher up on this graph, so you have more information on the individual. Now, let's say you have a building and you have a good idea of its 125-year-old uh, lifespan, so you have a lot of information over time of a building. You'll move upon this graph. Now, what clients usually brief is to take an average, and that's what you can't see here, but I've actually colored a piece here. So you take an average. And the result is average reconstruction drawings. Mm -hmm. So I just randomly, more or less, pick these to show you uh, what kind of stuff you'll get. Now, the different times. This is from the 1980s, this is from the 1960s. Uh, but these are still being made today, of course. Uh, these will always have the same kind of concept. They will show you, for instance, how the social be beehive works. So you will see workers, you will see families, you will see uh, the important buildings. In every illustration, there's there, mother with child, mother with child, mother with child in that one as well, or father with child, if you like. <laughs> what I seldomly get briefed, although I don't change the brief myself, is this. Just read it and then uh, once you stop laughing. Which is to concentrate on the small, the mundane and the personal. Now, of course, this is dangerous territory because it requires the use of imagination and therefore it is subjective and unscientific. Could be. Um, and uh, with most of those smaller experiences lost to us, 
what reconstructions tend to do is to uh, concentrate on, lands on landscape and place. And um, again, these are randomly picked. Um, and what you'll see is that, is that they're trying to be as complete as possible. Let's say they have a lot of information, they want to present it all in one go, because the more complete, the more true it is. Nonetheless, you here, for instance, today in this room, are interested in how your seat is sitting, if it's cold or not coming out, if there's cold coming in through the window. Uh, you'll be interested in where you can get coffee. You'll be interested in where the toilet is, especially. <laughs> uh, I bet you, you couldn't care less about what's happening in the room next door. This is an old and an interesting building, but I don't think you're very much interested in what's behind these walls. Whereas archaeology would have you, well, archaeologists would have you believe that all that is important in understanding how this place functions. But it doesn't, not for you as an individual here. Now, there is this. I'm going to skip over this quite quickly. Phenomenology. The idea is, <coughs> let's say you have a, a Mesolithic camp in a certain landscape. You know where the river is, you know the mountains were always there, so you stand on that spot and you wonder, well, how did they use the river? Was the river an important thing? Uh, how, how long would it take me to get to the mountains? Um, a way of interpreting the ancient experience of a place, of a landscape. Well, I'd like to extend that uh, to the personal, which is, what do I actually need to know to function? in this historical time, if you like. Now, four years ago, I was invited to uh, Egypt by the uh, Cotton Institute of the University of uh, Los Angeles uh, to uh, uh, help them, I was there for about a week, help them visualize. In the end, I must say, the project never came about. They didn't find it funding. Uh, and of course, there was a few troubles in Egypt. Um, a few. A few, yeah. <laughs> um, Saltman on the road is what I was told at the time, yeah. Um, and they had this bathhouse, which was being backfilled. So they had uh, excavated it several decades ago, they had re excavated it again. It was being uh, um, um, reconciled, um, how do you say, um, uh, um, made stronger again and then backfilled with sand. The idea was one day to open it up and have panels and show people what it, uh, what it looked like. Now, that was my job, just to sketch that, just to help them visualize it. But what I did, bearing in mind what I just told you before, my expansion of this phenomenology uh, uh, theory or uh, uh, method, is I asked different questions than the archeologists uh, themselves would have asked. Because of course they're interested in how the drains are running. I thought, well, if I was the bay, if I were more interested in where I hang my clothes, what the hot spot is, what the cold spot is, is it hot and sweaty and where, uh, where can I escape this? Um, in doing that, the curious thing was, this is was just one of the tiny sketches I made at uh, the, the time, I was finding features which were there in full sight, 40 years, which they had never questioned. So, for instance, uh, this thing is where the, uh, the lamp, uh, a, um, uh, like a hot water basin would have stood, and it had a fire under it. And when I mentioned that to the archaeologists, they saw no it was all suited at the top. So, asking these questions from a dis different perspective would give them a different way of reconstructing the building, not as a building, as a, as a structural entity, but as a place to use as a Roman. This is a sketch from, this, uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the same series. Um, I hope you understand that I'm not actually at, at attempting to reconstruct a room, although it is a good reconstruction of the room. I'm trying to attempt the experience of being in the room. And because if you do that, by concentrating on the experience, as a bonus, the internal logic becomes clear as well. Now, in Holland, I did a series on the Roman border area, the Limes. Now, they had a very, very good preservation there. I mean, when I, when, when I drew the, uh, the watchtower, it was based on four upright standing poles that they found, plus the ditch with the, all the, uh, the sharpened stakes in it. Very good preservation. 
We concentrate the series on uh, uh, the technical things that the Romans did there. But amongst a lot of uh, commentators, the best in the series is this one, which is uh, about a bridge that they found. They found, again, they found the wood, or a greater part of the wood, in very good condition. The wood had once or several times been destroyed by adverse Dutch weather condi conditions that the Romans weren't used to. So when I made my reconstruction, it, is a, it became to be about the experience that the Romans had there. Not the Romans, there's nothing in this picture that tags it as Roman. Actually, one of my clients had said, put a little Roman soldier in with a red cape, and he was told to go away. <laughs> Because we're not going to do that. This is, this is good enough. This tells you what the Romans experienced in the Dutch landscape, which is too much nature, too much water, too much cold, things they weren't used to and they had to deal with in the course of uh, making these structures. And to illustrate how alien this experience is, this is the spot now. So classic phenomenology would not be possible. You can't go and stand here and wonder what the Romans experienced. There's none of it left. Okay, you had an example like that as well, yeah. No. So, if we're not shown, uh, if, we're, if, we're, if we're heading towards overkill, then what to do? Now, one way is to go on a diet. <laughs> it's the same graph again. My suggestion is, for instance, simply to show restraint. Concentrate <coughs> on one of those dots just the one, or concentrate on one short period of time. A building in the morning, a building at night. Now, of course, in the course of years, I've done or at least tried to do this. So I'm gonna end on several slides where I've actually uh, myself attempted this, well, attempted, gone for restraint. So for instance, this was for uh, the teaching company in the United States, one of their uh, film lectures. It's about, uh, I think it says, the origins of religion. But I had just been to the, um, to the uh, Lascaux uh, replica in uh, France. And the most impressive thing I thought was the scale. So this is all about experiencing the scale of the thing. Not how it is made, not who was using it, not what, even what it was used for. But the scale of the thing is the impressive thing you want to bring about, or bring, bring across. This was done for his magazine, not the other one you only met two days ago, uh, in America, uh, Stonehenge. The archaeological research behind this was done with the best of the best. I mean, uh, Mike Pitts, who excavated Stonehenge, wrote the article. Everything down to the measurements uh, uh, of the, the sled, which apparently was the first time. Well, that was the first time I was shown the working of the stones was the first time apparently it was ever shown in an illustration. They were, they were all done to measurements, they're all very precise, but I carved the whole illustration in something that would tell you where it was as well. And I loved it when the magazine picked it up and in their um, a caption it actually said, work at Stonehenge has been um, um, uh, halted by a typically British uh, summer <laughs> spell of rain. <laughs> And then hopefully that kind of sort of human experience um, uh, leads you to, to question all the different elements, which in this case is a lot about family groups working on the uh, on Stonehenge. This is based on a very well-preserved bug body, northern Germany. Um, you can construe it as a reconstruction of his mantle, if you want. Uh, there was some wool and uh, underclothing found, but I won't show on the edge because there was no more. But actually, this is a very precise scientific reconstruction of the boy's haircut. Because somebody uh, at the museum in Hanover, the Landless Museum, um, uh, measured the hair on the bug body. And it's nothing special. It's like any 10 year old, 10 year old boy's haircut now. But I thought that was the curious thing. This, I believe, does bridge some gap between us and two and a half thousand years ago. This is a series that, I, uh, part of a series that uh, where I'm doing where I'm, I'm telling the history of a, of a castle, not by interpreting it, but by showing the objects simply for what they were. So this was a, a fat catcher, I don't know what the English word is. Um, dripping, pan. Hmm? dripping pan. Uh, dripping pan. 
And uh, um, I mean, there's a very obvious thing. Why did they put this under the the roast to 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 pick up the fat uh, to uh, collect the fat to drip it back onto the, uh, the whatever is roasting? There's another thing. They actually made their, it's a cheap way of making candles. And um, um, uh, the awkward thing about that is that it makes your house smell like pig's fat. So um, I'm telling the story by simply taking the objects as if they were yesterday. And, and this is then my last uh, slide because uh, I've been working with this. This is a panel I designed. It's in my own home village. It's been presented coming Saturday, so you're amongst the first to see it. Um, where if it is effective, I'll find out on Saturday. Um, I'm bridging. I'm trying to bridge the gap between the past and and the present by forgetting that the past was ever a was was the past, and by connecting whatever mundane normal things they were doing, they're building a place. Yeah, it's just a you know a muddy, pl a muddy place. Connecting it with photographs which are in the past. These are from 1968. Uh, and these people will be present. So um, it's connect. It's it's saying that this is going to be a very unglorious uh, ending comment. But it's saying that uh, the past was no different than uh, uh, the, uh, the present. Terrible sentence. I had a better one on paper. But anyway, I can leave it at that. Thank you.